You're listening to Parent MD, the podcast where top pediatric experts do the homework for you, sharing clear and trustworthy medical advice so parents feel empowered to take the very best care of their kids. Welcome to Parent MD, where today we have with us Dr. Wesley Sublett. Thanks, Josh. I appreciate you having me here today. Yeah, it's a great uh, treat and appreciate your time with Parent MD and helping us put together the asthma toolkit and uh, really enjoyed the conversation day and interviews and all the information you shared for our parents. So that was great. Yeah, I hope that our parents out there, they really enjoy the information and hopefully that helps them uh, with getting an appropriate diagnosis of asthma. I think that and all the tips and tricks you gave around management and the things they need to know that just every parent should know to to be informed and empowered. Today, will you start by telling us a little bit about where you're from, your training, education, and your career path? You know, I've kind of taken a uh, windy road to um, get to where I am, but I'm originally from Louisville, Kentucky. And so I guess you can say I came back home to practice, but... um, Originally, after graduating from a small liberal arts college called Transylvania University, I went to a school of public health to get a master's in epidemiology at St. Louis University. And it was during my time there that I recognized that I I wanted to go into medicine. Originally, I thought I was going to do clinical research, but kind of recognized that I liked working with people and patients and My father was a physician and probably had tried everything not to go into medicine, but did like the aspect of working with people. So came back to Louisville, Kentucky to do uh, med school here and um, went into pediatrics and eventually found my way up to Cincinnati University where I did my allergy fellowship after I completed pediatrics in Louisville and now practice in Louisville, Kentucky, at a place called Family Allergy and Asthma, but we are a large single specialty practice that covers now multiple states, but I practice mainly throughout Louisville and Central Kentucky. Yeah, so definitely the largest allergy asthma group in the state and a, a great brand, and I'll, I'll note a couple things. Um, Wes's father is one of the founding members of the group and uh, known his father and worked with him when I was in practice in the community for years, and then As a treat, I had Wes as a medical student with me years ago at Oldham County Pediatrics. And so Wes and I go way back, and it's been a joy watching him go through medical school residency, go to fellowship, and come back in the community. want to be one of the esteemed allergists and asthma doctors. And to have him here today is a a real treat for me. Well, I appreciate that, Josh. And, you know, it is allergy is very unique. Um, I didn't know this when I went into it. Um, really, I went into allergy not because of my father, but I, I just really was drawn to immunology and those kind of the idea of knowing specific pathways and really um, being able to affect quality of life for patients. It is an area that, like no other area in medicine, that if we do things appropriately, we can really affect the quality of life of our patients so they can go on to really do whatever they want to do. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about how you feel the ability of the physician today to manage asthma is different than it was 10, 20, 30 years ago. Talk about the tools in your toolbox and then also allude to what the future holds. Oh, gosh, that's that's a great question, Josh. Really, there's been this kind of advent of new therapies and new technology for the treatment of allergic diseases, not including asthma. And uh, even in the past five years, we've gained more tools than we ever did before. The idea of treating allergic disease today is more about what we call precision medicine, or really tailoring that individualized treatment for a patient based on their disease severity and their disease pathways. And as an immunologist, we could really bore people about those immunological pathways that cause disease, but in reality... We have targeted treatments for those now, so we can really fine-tune and tailor for that patient what best treatment we uh, they need. And due to that, we can really affect quality of life. For asthma and for eczema, gosh, we've, we, we now have things that are life-changing. 
for the longest time, this was very protocol driven. We had kind of these classes of medications that did okay, but especially with the advent of biologic medications, which are these specially tailored kind of smart bomb therapies we have in medicine, we're able to target specific pathways in the immune system that lead to greater quality of life and improve disease control. How important is it on the pathway of going down and finding these personalized regimens? Is it that you have a great relationship with the parent and compliance, especially if it is a personalized approach? Yeah, so with the personalized approach, obviously compliance plays a big role with any disease management. And if you don't have the trust of your patients, then you're not going to achieve compliance. You can have the best medication in the world, but if they don't understand how the medication works or what role it plays or what the potential side effects are, and they don't trust you as a physician, then it doesn't matter what medicine you're giving. And so having that trust with a patient to tailor those medications and not only tailor those medications, but make sure we're adequately getting the level of control that the patient wants. Uh, We need to have expectations both as a provider and as a patient, but we really should be tailoring medications to achieve really good disease control so we minimize hospitalizations, ER visits, absenteeism, and really achieving good quality of life for our patients because that's what they want and expect. They want something now. They want something that's safe. And they want to really live a otherwise normal life that's not affected by their disease. So you're quite involved in research locally and known for it on a national level. What What is the most groundbreaking thing out there in the next few years coming due to research in the field of asthma? That That's a great question. We continue to have the development of new biologics or smart bombs within the immune system that really target pathways that cause the disease. And um, those continue to be the future in really all of medicine, from asthma to other disease states. But specifically in asthma, that's going to be continue to be the um, in the near future, those therapies that really will be life-changing for asthmatic patients. Right. So the parents are hearing a lot about these biologics and these conversations. Many of our other speakers recently have, have talked about that. Do you, for the parents, define what a biologic is, what, what they need to know about, why they should be as excited about it as you are? And is there anything they need to worry about when coming in this new age with the biologics? Yeah, so, you know, biologics are a class of medications that are created, um, they're antibodies that are created through the use of science to target certain immune pathways. And they're specific to certain immune pathways. And parents should be excited because, especially for those that have severe or moderate to severe asthma or other diseases, these really target what drives disease. And as we get better targets, we'll get better therapies. For example, some of the research that's ongoing right now is, can we early in life use some of these biologics to maybe prevent progression or even the onset of some of the other allergic diseases that we see and I treat. There's studies ongoing now with biologics, not only to prevent uh, maybe future onset of asthma in young kids, but also maybe even prevent uh, the onset of food allergies. So we're kind of at this kind of, um, we're not near the peak of the wave. We're at the kind of the early stages and all this. And I I really think in my lifetime, we'll have disease modifying therapies available for my patients. Yeah. And the beauty is not just in your field, even though you're also an immunologist, so it's very heavy in your field. It's going to be in so many other fields of medicine. On a fun note, in a conversation earlier, we were talking about how you have uh, some land and you have children and you mentioned alpacas. So, how does a, an allergist come to own an alpaca? And 
do you ever see um, people with allergies to alpacas? That's a great question. <laughs> I have yet to test anybody for alpaca. I was just curious. But I have two children. One will be starting kindergarten in the fall and one will uh, be in second grade. It is, um, we are in the era of COVID right now. And so it, it became our COVID edition. The, the four alpaca, who I'll go ahead and mention their names. Uh, so we have Bella, Coco Chanel, <laughs> we have Phoebe, and we have Gwen Stefani. They're all of our four alpacas. Well, then it sounds like you have a, an alpaca addiction, not just addition. Because I thought you only had one or two, but you've got four. Well, they are herd animals, so we need more than one. Okay. And um, here recently, we also have three sheep. My wife originally, where she uh, grew up in central Kentucky, she raised sheep. Yeah. And so I did not know that alpaca are considered guard animals for sheep, but usually either you have to have either a donkey or some other type of guard animal for your sheep. And so we ended up getting alpaca before the sheep and there are <laughs> there are guard animals. Interesting. But it's a great it's a great learning opportunity for our kids. So obvious I was gonna say, obviously you did not get those for you and your wife. I'm gonna gather you got them for the children. As a, a pediatrician, obviously we like kids. All the more, not that everybody else doesn't, but we like, we have a special place for them given that's the path we chose in medicine. How has being a parent impacted you being a pediatrician and how do you continue to evolve and how you practice medicine based on being a parent? Uh, Good question. So prior to having children, I always had this mindset of treating everybody like I would my family. And I think that's an appropriate way to treat in medicine, because if you're not going to do something to your own family, you probably shouldn't do it to your patient. Right. But now having that connection of having children, yeah, now it's even more so, especially as a pediatrician and as an allergist who treats both kids and adults, I think to myself, would I do this to my own child? Right. What are the side effects of the medications or therapies I use to treat your patient? Would that you know, how would that sway me in treating my own child? And and so I, I'm lucky right now, but both of my children don't really have any allergy symptoms that I'm aware of. But, you know, I, I use the, the mantra of I'm going to treat your child like I would treat my own child. Right. And I wouldn't do anything to your child that I wouldn't do to my own child. And I really take that to heart because I think that's the only appropriate way to treat in medicine. And with any thing we do in medicine, there's risk, but there's also benefit. And we want our children to achieve their best potential. And that's in health and prosperity. But health is such a major role in quality of life. So I I just kind of look at my own children every day when I wake up and think, okay, how can I help my patients achieve what I want my own children to achieve? I would agree, and I want to add another facet to that that um, has kind of struck me through the recent years. As a pediatrician, you see all of your patients kind of an extension of your family. They're like your children. And for me, I was in practice. um, I started practice 20 years ago, so now I'm seeing a lot of these kids as grown adults. They'll come up to me with beards and say, you're my pediatrician, and I, I don't even recognize them now. And you look at them, and you're proud, like a proud parent when they tell you what they've been doing. They, It's an extension of your family, no doubt. The one thing that I did evolve in my view of the world and practice through the years, though, was I would make recommendations and want to offer to treat my other children like I would my own. But you learn through the years, too, the aspect that you have to respect that each parent's different. And what they want for their children may not be what you would want for your children. So... I was kind of stubborn. I think it took me a while to get there because I thought everybody should see the world through my lens. And and I'm thinking, this is how I would treat my own children. Talk to me about how through the years you've appreciated and grown knowing that we all don't see our kids even the same. And it doesn't matter if it's vaccines. It doesn't matter if it's a medicine or a procedure or whatever. We have to respect and recognize as providers that parents you know, they're, they're, it's their children, and they get to make choice. Our biggest job is to provide information, support, and recommendations. So I've tailored how I've thought about this through the years. It's more that we make recommendations, and this is what we would do if it was our children. But 
we really support all the more, I think now, more than we did 10 years ago and 20 years ago, parents having the autonomy, which they want and deserve for how their children are taken care of. Would you agree? I, I would totally agree. And I think you hit on the appropriate word, and that's the word choice. Because while as physicians, we're here to guide you in your health, patients deserve choice. And, you know, there's lots of what I call buzzwords in medicine, precision medicine, which is this idea of tailoring medicine to an individual, our shared decision making. Really what it comes down to is choice. We as physicians should talk to our patients about choices they have available to them. And it's okay for you to disagree with what a physician has and be allowed to maybe even pursue an alternative. Going back to biologics as an example, you know, we have multiple biologics that we can use in the treatment of severe asthma. Some of those are available to uh, younger children. Some of, most of them are available to adolescents. Some patients choose not to pursue a biologic, even though they are good candidates for it, and that, in my opinion, could minimize some of their exacerbations or worsening of their asthma and get them under better control. But it's a choice. And sometimes, just like in life, just because you make a choice at one moment in time doesn't mean you don't come back to discuss or change your mind. I mean, I, I've been wrong, not only as a parent, but as a physician. Sometimes our initial reaction, our initial choice is not always the best choice. And so we have to understand that parents are individuals their children are individuals, and what may work best for one patient may not work best for the next patient, even though they look similar. And so I think we just should allow choice, giving them the information they may need to make the best choice for their situation, and be, instead of this idea of top-down approach and telling people what to do, kind of just being a guide on their journey of health. Yeah. No, that's great. And I think it's more of that partnership now versus used to it was definitely more of the top down. So thinking about asthma, is asthma still the number one reason for being admitted to the hospital year in, year out? It's definitely in the top five. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen the latest statistics, but gosh, I mean, a third of the world's population has an allergic disease and yeah. a third of those have asthma. So it's still tends to be something we see a lot of. And I'm, I'm recollecting from years ago um, from uh, supporting different hospital services with asthma being as one of those top admitting diagnoses. Do you think there will ever be a day that we look back and say, boy, you remember how asthma like was one of the top chronic diseases and now we just don't hardly see it? Is that day around the corner and do you foresee it? I wish that would happen. I, I don't foresee it happening in my lifetime, but I do think that the day of hospitalizations, uh, we already know there's been a reduction as therapies have improved in the past uh, decade. So I hope that continues. There's still such a under-recognition of asthma, an under-recognition of severe asthma, that I still think in my lifetime we're still going to face those challenges. But with the advent of new therapies hopefully even disease modifying or early interventions that may prevent onset. I, I hope we continue this downward trend and maybe one day approach zero. So of all of the children that have asthma, what percentage of those that have asthma, neither they nor their family and their doctor hasn't picked it up? Well, um, I'll speak a lot about severe asthma. So severe asthma, whether it's in pediatrics or in adults, we know that probably upwards of 30 to 50 percent of them are either underdiagnosed, meaning that they're classified with less severe asthma, or they're not diagnosed at all with asthma. And so it's just a challenge because, you know, without appropriate interventions or therapies, they really, over a person's lifetime, can be exposed to some 
things that lead to long-term consequences, and one of those is prednisone. I mean, prednisone is something we use for asthma attacks or asthma exacerbations, but I, I tell my patients consistently now, if you're, if the, it's the rule of twos. If you've been on two courses of steroids in the past year, you're not controlled. If you're waking up twice a month, you're not controlled. If you're using your albuterol twice a week, you're not controlled. And so we really in medicine should focus on appropriate therapy and accurate diagnosis because something that happens routinely in my office is sometimes a patient comes in with a diagnosis of asthma and they don't have asthma. Right. And that can also lead to long-term side effects as well because if you're taking a medicine for a disease you don't have, you're, you could have some consequences later on. So before patients come see you for a visit, what tips and tricks do you have for them that will help them come for a successful visit for both you and the patient? With any visit, and this includes when I go see the doctor, I think we have to come in with an open mind because we all have a, an idea in our head of what that final outcome should be. And so, but we're also nervous about what procedures or what things they may ask during. Um, so come in with an open mind, come in with information. That information should include, okay, this is the symptoms we're seeing in my child. This is how often it happens. Know some family history. It doesn't mean you have to know all the details, but any piece of information I have in a history is going to help me establish a diagnosis. And they be open-minded to maybe undergo some diagnostic testing. And that diagnostic testing can be as simple as spirometry, which is a lung function test where a child blows into a machine, or it may include allergy skin testing. And for a lot of parents and a lot of pediatricians, they actually think the worst is going to happen. But a lot of children really do well with allergy skin testing. Um, but the nervousness of a parent, the nervousness of a physician, um, we we kind of can impact that visit just by a parent being nervous because the kids sense that. But, you know, we really want to establish an appropriate, accurate diagnosis of asthma. And so sometimes these tools like skin testing can be a little uncomfortable, but they're pretty well tolerated by kids. Well, enjoyed the conversation today, Dr. Sublett. It's great to spend time with you as always and appreciate your collaboration, partnership with ParentMD to put the asthma tool together. And so thanks for being with us today. Well, thank you, Josh. I appreciate the invite. You've been listening to ParentMD, the podcast where top pediatric experts do the homework for you, sharing clear and trustworthy medical advice so parents feel empowered to take the very best care of their kids. If you enjoyed today's episode, go ahead and click on that follow button on your favorite podcast app. It's the best way to make sure you never miss a single episode. And while you're at it, why not leave a five-star rating and comment as well? We'd love to hear your feedback, and it helps other parents find the show. The ParentMD Podcast is a part of ParentMD, a new way for pediatricians to help parents. ParentMD is an online source of parent information you can trust straight from board-certified pediatricians. For more information about ParentMD, visit us at our website, www.parentmd.com. That's it for this episode, but we will be back soon to tackle another topic to help parents make confident and informed decisions about their children's health.